So um, after having served as program chair for the past several years, I'm continually reminded of just how lucky we are to have Maud DC as a mushroom club, more so than any other club. I imagine we're blessed to have so many members who are able to speak to us about a far ranging topics under this vast umbrella called mycology. For example, in past year, we've heard wonderful lectures from Megan Romberg about micro microfungi, uh, William Davis twice, once about the mold that ate everything, Cisgides megalocarpus, and more recently about chytrids, Jared Urchek about Ganodermas, Saranella Linares about bioluminescent fungi, Shannon Nix about mushroom reproduction, uh, myself about wheat lacoche, and last but certainly not least, we had a great lecture last month on lichens from Natalie Howe. Apologies if I've forgotten to mention anybody, it certainly wasn't intentional. Um, tonight, we're going to add a few more names to that list as Dr. Chris Wozniak, John Cow, and uh, Jenny Kausch, tell us about a fascinating part of mycology that I'm sure a few of you are familiar with, using fungi as a form of biocontrol. Pesticide, herbicide, fungicide, regicide perhaps. And I, for one, cannot wait to learn all about it. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Chris, John, and Janine. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. Uh, I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen. This is going to be a tag team approach to presentation. So we're going to start off with uh, our colleague, John Cow and Sonny Bethesda. And then we'll rejoin uh, in a little bit on slide 10. Thanks, Chris. I guess there we go. Um, I am very, very happy that I don't have to follow Albert because uh, Mitch did a good uh, segue into what we're doing uh, with the fungal biopesticides, but there's not much that could compare to morel cooking and just looking at those delightful beasts in, even in pictures. So uh, to start off tonight, we're looking at uh, an overview of fungal biopesticides. And unlike all the wonderful macro fungi that we talk about frequently, about as colorful as we get is uh, what you see here down in the lower left-hand corner, which are plates that as the fungi grow, they'll secrete things into the medium. And sometimes you get reds and purples and things like that. But generally the micro fungi are not quite as dramatic as uh, what we're typically seeing in pictures uh, in Ma. Next slide. So because we're government employees, we always have to say that we're just speaking for ourselves. And although we're going to be talking about some things about uh, pesticides and how they're registered and things like that, uh, we are speaking for ourselves. And all the materials presented are the responsibility of the presenters. Except, of course, if you hear anything about this darn sugar beet root maggot, I have nothing to do with that. That's all Chris. Next slide. So tonight we're going to be talking about the role of biopesticides, especially in uh, agriculture, uh, application of these to agricultural environments. We'll give you some uh, examples of commercial products and then focus in on those fungal biocontrol agents that you may not know about at all. We'll also discuss risk assessment and some of the things that we look at in terms of assessing the safety for these uh, products. And Chris has some thought provokers here. Do uh, you think that patenting uh, microbes or any kind of life form is a good idea? And he will also discuss the future for fungal biopesticides. Okay, in terms of biopesticides, at least at EPA, there are a number of different categories. Uh, one of them is biochemical pesticides, and these are things that are used. They don't, they don't really kill the, the pest, but they do uh, can disrupt the mating cycle. They can act as repellents. Uh, some of them are plant extracts. There are plant growth regulators. Uh, 
more to what we're talking about tonight will be the microbial pesticides, but other things that are considered biopesticides are what are called plant incorporated protectants, which are uh, basically genetically engineered plants that uh, I'm sure you've heard of corn that expresses BT toxins to control corn borer and uh, rootworm. And there have also been products developed that uh, enhance the resistance of something like potato to the famous uh, late, late blight fungus, the uh, potato famine fungus that is at least in part responsible for some of the Irish immigration to this country. And finally, there are also uh, instances where the agency has uh, regulated genetically engineered mosquitoes for control of uh, mosquito populations, kind of similar to uh, the sterile male release uh, technology that has been used so successfully to control screw worms in uh, the southern US. And now it's uh, under exclusion from all the way down to uh, Central America. So that's been a real success story. But tonight we're going to be talking about microbial pesticides. <clears throat> and uh, those include a number of different agents that can control algae, uh, uh, fungi, uh, can control plants as herbicides or insecticides. And they run the gamut of uh, different life forms from viruses of bacteria to bacteria themselves to fungi and viruses that infect both plants and insects and also proteins. But tonight we're going to be talking mostly about fungi. Next one, Chris. Here's just kind of a schematic. Uh, the different kinds of things that are used for insect control. We have plant extracts. You may be familiar with uh, nicotine, the active ingredient in your favorite cigarettes and tobacco. Well, that's also a very potent uh, insecticide, as are in, <clears throat> extracts of the chrysanthemum um, uh, daisy, uh, what are called pyrethrum. And those are also very potent uh, insecticides that have been chemically synthesized. And you may have heard a lot in the news about neonicotinoids or pyrethroids. Those are all basically based on those uh, plant extract type chemicals. But other uh, biopesticides would include uh, control measures that are employing bacteria, fungi, and viruses. They can either be directly parasitic, they can ex express enzymes that have, uh, will degrade the insect chitin, or they can act directly as uh, parasites, or again, as repellents. And in the lower right-hand corner, you'll see a mosquito that <clears throat> has gone all the way to uh, sporulation with uh, metarhizium and isoplea. Next. We are, there are also a number of biopesticides that have been developed to protect plants uh, from plant disease and also provide growth uh, enhancement. So these act, uh, can act directly by enhancing uh, the uptake of nitrogen or uh, minerals such as uh, phosphorus and uh, potassium. They're also <clears throat> similar to what we were talking about earlier. There are also compounds that can be expressed by uh, microbes in the soil that uh, enhance the uptake of micronutrients to the plant. In addition, there are, and those would all be considered basically plant uh, growth enhancement through either the production of hormones or enhanced uh, nutrient uptake. There's also the ability of these organisms to affect basically what's called kind of the plant immune system, where they can uh, basically induce a resistance phenomenon before the plant is challenged by disease organisms. And if you look at the little <clears throat> tadpoles 
looking at the tadpoles reminds me that just yesterday I went out and I heard wood frogs peeping in the woods and they're mating now, friends. So spring is on the way, there's no doubt about it. But anyway, the bacteria uh, also have the ability to either act directly against the pathogens in the soil by the product production of various uh, compounds that will uh, lyse the pathogens or uh, hyperparasitize them or uh, produce toxins or lytic enzymes like we spoke uh, about earlier. Next. Here are examples of things that you'll find on your shelves uh, at the uh, hardware store or at uh, the Home Depot. And uh, the first one, uh, the first biological uh, product that was registered by the Department of Agriculture in the 40s was actually something I remember my mom using on her rose bushes to control Japanese beetles, and that's called milky spore. It's in the, the, the uh, kind of lavender box there. It's a bacillus, a bacterial species. There are also a number of other bacteria here. Bacillus subtilis can be used to control uh, plant diseases. Uh, if we go counterclockwise, we've got nematodes that are uh, used for insect control. Uh, there's chromobacterium called Grandivo that is also produces like a toxin, uh, similar to Bacillus thuringiensis that can control insects. Uh, it's very specific in its mode of action. And finally, there's the trichoderma that are used. Uh, it's a fungus that's used to inoculate seedlings or the soil in newly planting in newly planted uh, fields to protect the roots from uh, especially uh, soil-borne uh, plant pathogens. Next. <clears throat> so here we have a USDA researcher looking at a flask full of fungi. And it's just to remind you that while there's a lot of development that goes on in the laboratory, when it comes to producing a commercial product, it much more closely resembles the beer uh, facilities that you see at, say, Flying Dog or um, the uh, brewery, the Dogfish Head Brewery in Delaware. They're huge tanks, and then they process the growth media to remove the active fungal uh, organisms in order to package them and, and sell them on the marketplace. Fungal bias, uh, biopesticides run the gamut from insecticides, uh, arachnicides, and uh, acaricides and miticides. They're also involved in plant disease uh, management as hyperparasites of things like sclerotia in the, uh, in the soil that uh, can cause uh, root diseases. And they can also act as antagonists to uh, organisms in the soil. Uh, some fungi have been developed as uh, weed control for uh, by actually being plant pathogens against the specific weeds. There are also nematicides that are fungi for both control of plant pathogens, uh, plant pathogenic nematodes, and livestock uh, infesting uh, nematodes. Uh, mycorrhizae, uh, the, both the ectomycorrhizae and arbuscular mycorrhizae uh, are not really considered pesticides, but this is a point at which uh, it may be useful to mention that what really determines a pesticide is what you claim on the label. So if you have something that you control, like an insect or a disease, then that kind of takes you over into the role of being a pesticidal uh, claim. Uh, there are also uh, fungi that are, uh, can be plant growth enhancers, in other words, producing uh, hormones. 
And as I mentioned earlier, there are some fungi that are actually known to induce the resistance phenomenon in, um, in plants when they're inoculated. And they can be used both as a viable organism, or there are some of them that it can be actually uh, heat killed and used in that form. Most of them, like I mentioned, are microfungi or fungi imperfecti, uh, most likely related to ascomycetes in their uh, sexual state, but not all of them are. And uh, there also is the possibility that these fungi can be genetically engineered. We've seen a few of those, but they have not been commercialized at this point. Next, Chris. Uh, biological agents that we're talking about have um, some advantages in terms of their reduced uh, environmental impact and a uh, good outcome for human health compared to some of the uh, conventional chemicals that are currently being used in large-scale agriculture. Um, they are uh, somewhat the wave of the future, but in terms of their usefulness, they tend to be uh, a smaller host range that they will actually affect, and they tend to not be persistent. So they have a shorter lifetime in the environment, but that can be both good and bad in terms of uh, use in agriculture. And uh, again, uh, the public doesn't accept some of these uh, approaches because it doesn't give you necessarily the same level of pest control. But they do have a significant uh, use in terms of reducing synthetic pesticides. And uh, I think an important part of that is enhancing uh, the resistance of the organisms that you're trying to control by employing these types of strategies. In other words, uh, for conventionals, oftentimes they're overused and because it's a, a single chemical, it can develop resistance. And when you have uh, huge populations of these organisms, kind of like what we're talking uh, about now with COVID, when you get huge reproductions uh, of organisms, the population can generate variation. So uh, in order to slow down that process, if you have multiple selection agents, so multiple chemicals or the use of biologicals, it can actually change the, uh, the character of those pathogens that you're trying to control. And so new products are always on the march. And uh, the next slide will give you a, an example of some of the uh, fungi that we have uh, at the EPA registered uh, within, uh, well, within the time I've been there, which is 30 years. So um, two of the ones here that are actually uh, uh, the Cidiomycetes that you may be aware of are uh, the Chondrosterium purpureum. This has been developed especially for an alternative to herbicides in, say, uh, power line maintenance. So there are preparations that can be used when uh, the crews go through and uh, cut down the, the sprouts under the power lines, and they can basically uh, coat the cut surfaces with chondrosterium, and that will provide very effective vegetation management in the uh, right of ways. And then there's also the Phlebiopsis gigantea, which is used when uh, people are harvesting uh, forest stands. And then if you coat the cut stump, of a, a pine uh, tree after it's been harvested. This can prevent the spread of the heterobasidion anosum, which is a very uh, destructive uh, disease of conifer forests, especially in the Northwest where um, it's a major pathogen. A lot of these other ones, we've got uh, hyperparasites, We've got uh, plant pathogens such as uh, 
uh, control a daughter. We, there's a special species of alternary that can do that. Uh, we have post-harvest control of rot uh, by Candida, Candida. And then there's a, a kind of an interesting one, the Aspergillus flavus. I am sure that um, most people on the call are aware of aflatoxins and how they uh, are a major problem in, in corn and, and cotton seed but also a major problem in the quality of almonds and pistachios. And what uh, this particular uh, fungus is uh, used for is it's what's called an atoxigenic strain. And it basically outcompetes the uh, toxin producers in the field when they're treated and uh, reduces aflatoxin contamination of the treated crop. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I think I'll pass it on to Chris at this time and he can go from here. It's not advancing. There, oh. Yeah, it froze for a second. All right, there we go. There Thanks, we go. John. Sure. Okay, so... Uh, We'll continue along the same lines here, but uh, I want to point out a couple of things with uh, this trichoderma, and there are many species, like almost all the fungi that I'll talk about tonight. Uh, it just seems like the taxonomists have gone nuts, especially the splitters. So this was called T. Harzi trichoderma harzianum, but in fact, that turned out to be multiple species. This one in particular, strain T22, is I think particularly interesting for one reason, it's been a successful product for I think at least 25 years, came out of uh, a Hort professor's lab at Cornell. And it serves, uh, I think, to demonstrate a couple things. One is that, as John was mentioning with this Aspergillus, where you sort of preempt other pathogenic or toxigenic organisms from colonizing something, in this case, the root zone, uh, that's, that's one mode of action for T22. And you can see the little uh, arrow pointing to the hyphal thread on there and, and some bacterial colonies for comparison. Now, the other thing is that um, although T22 does a good job of reducing the incidence of some diseases in the root zone, in addition, we find out over time that it has some what we call plant growth regulator properties. It's a good colonizer of the rhizosphere or, or immediate root zone, and it stimulates the plant. Uh, like many of these fungi, we don't understand all the modes of action of how these work. Is there some antibiosis in some cases? Is there are chemical secreted that knocks out some other microbes in the area? Uh, is it secreting something that's comparable to a phytohormone? that stimulates it. We don't quite know all that, but from our standpoint, looking at it as a, a risk assessment process, what we need to know is, is that it's safe. And again, I'll return to this a little later, this idea of how we humans like to categorize things and think of them either as an insecticide or an herbicide or a plant growth regulating organism or whatever. And as we go on further into this uh, sort of down the rabbit hole, we find out that a lot of these have multiple modes of action. So this fungus, Boveria bassiana here on a, a lycus bug, a tarnished plant bug, is one of the workhorses of the entomopathogenic fungi. Uh, this and the one I'll talk about next, I think are probably responsible for the most uh, use and number of products in commercial use today. There are several things notable about this one, but uh, one of the ones I find, uh, because I'm a scientific geek, that I find particularly interesting is that this Dr. Bossi, who uh, first described this white muscardine disease in silkworms, established that this microbe was in fact responsible for the pathology you see in this picture, at least on silkworms. And he did that 30 years before Pasteur, 
did it with, uh, you know, anthrax and before DeBerry did it with the potato famine fungus, uh, Phytophthora and Festans. But largely forgotten, most people credit Pasteur, of course. Uh, other things interesting about this fungus is that it, it is a fairly broad host range. A lot of biopesticides, we seek out specificity that reduces uncertainty and thereby reduces risk. But this one, uh, depending on the strain, uh, will infect usually a fair number of, of different hosts. And that's, I guess, one other thing to point out is that when these are regulated and approved for uh, commercial use or even experimental use, they're done so at the strain level. You don't, you know, register a species. It's a specific strain. And uh, we can talk about that a little later. There are basically processes and, and data that have to be produced to ensure the stability of that strain in storage and in cultivation. Metarhizium uh, robertsi, which used to be M. anisopliae uh, is the other big workhorse fungus in terms of endopathogenic fungi that I'll talk about. Like a lot of these, you know, M. anisopliae turned out to be a multi species complex, probably, I don't even know what the last count is, 910 species. So the name changed several years ago. And you probably remember uh, Ray St. Leger, Leger from University of Maryland, speaking to the group a couple of years ago. This is sort of his fungus, so to speak. This is his baby, and he's been great to work with. He's one of the people, John alluded to uh, genetically engineered fungi, that picture early on in the slide deck of that mosquito that's sporulating uh, fungus on there is an early stage uh, you know, sporulation of metarhizium from Ray's lab. And in that case, again, he's using some other fungal genes, mostly from metarhizium itself, to enhance the production of certain enzymes like proteases, and in one case, a spider toxin that you know will kill the insects, whether it's a migratory locust or an Anopheles mosquito, kill it faster before it has a chance to spread and to reproduce. So this uh, metarhizium is another good example where, again, you know, whether you take a insect pathology course or a mycology course that covers these, this is always spoken of as an entoma pathogen. And partly through Ray's work and, and some others, we come to realize that this very likely has plant growth promoting properties. There is even some uh, research that suggests this fungus can grow inside the plant in a non pathogenic manner and thereby, thereby influence the behavior, the development of the plant. There are some other mycologists I've spoken to who dispute some of this and argue it's contamination. But it, one thing that is absolutely clear is that it is good at colonizing plant materials. So on the lower right, you see this genetically engineered version. This is from uh, Stefan Jaronski's lab when he was with ARS out in uh, Sydney, Montana, he put a green fluorescent protein gene in there. It's originally derived from a jellyfish. So he's got a GFP positive metarhizium. He worked briefly on sugar beet root maggots as, as I did as well, and demonstrated that this fungus is in fact uh, readily capable of colonizing the root surface. Now, one of the things John will talk about in a little bit in terms of risk assessment, you know, you always, again, don't want to uh, categorize things so tightly that you, you put blinders on. Some of these species and some of the strains of one species of, of metarhizium are known to cause keratitis in humans, infections in reptiles. When I talked to Ray about this years ago when we were... Uh, doing some assessments of various strains. He told me about what he called hot strains from Brazil and said that basically he stays away from those. And these are things that, you know, perhaps they grow at a higher temperature and therefore can survive at uh, human body temperature uh, that 
maybe makes them a little more pathogenic. Maybe they have some different toxins. Uh, both Bovaria and Metarhizium, I don't think we're going to talk about it a whole lot tonight, but I do want to mention they both make uh, several versions of peptide-based toxins, which have varying degrees of impact on different organisms. The destructions I, met, I mentioned here at the bottom of the slide are, are one example of these cyclopeptides that uh, have significant activity. Again, another reason not to pigeonhole things, just a couple of years ago, and this has actually been seen rarely, but occasionally in, in Kentucky, for example, in Ohio, but this case comes from Germany. And here we have a trichoderma, both the Harzianum and Afroharzianum, basically acting as a pathogen on corn. This is particularly true in a hot, dry year in this part of uh, southern Germany. You can see on, on the uh, little photo labeled E, you can see the causes premature germination of the kernels. Obviously not, not exactly uh, something you want. And as well, some of these trichodermas also produce toxins. So this was a bit of a surprise, but again, as John mentioned, when you have widespread uh, I, don't, I hate to say ubiquitous, but pretty close. There are trichodermas everywhere. You're going to get significant variation over time, and some of them may pick up, in addition to their plant colonizing ability, the ability to actually infect the plant and cause uh, a disease. On the right, we couldn't have a talk without at least a couple pictures of mushrooms. So this. Um, Going back, you know, at least 30 years, probably longer, people well recognize that they used to call them race or biotype four, and that fell out of uh, taxonomic certain years ago. But that group of trichodermas was notorious for uh, messing up the, uh, whatever you want to call them, the houses, the mushroom houses in southeastern Pennsylvania. And basically, you know, made it impossible to grow uh, mushrooms in some places. You couldn't just go in there and dump on a fungicide because how are you going to grow mushrooms then? And interestingly, some of the cases I've read about uh, some other strains, uh, not the same as in Pennsylvania, but related strains in Ireland where one or two mushroom houses get it. And with a matter of a few years, virtually every mushroom house has that strain and it crosses over to England and on to uh, continental Europe. So it is a real problem. In addition, there are a couple of other trichoderma species, one of them, Pleuroticola, that interferes with uh, oyster mushroom cultivation, and yet another one that impacts uh, shiitake cultivation. So they are a significant problem. And I've read research papers on you know, hot water treatments for logs before you inoculate and alkaline water treatments to reduce the likelihood of a uh, wild type trichoderma entering your cultivation. So now we can switch uh, briefly over here a little bit on regulation. Janine, do you wanna? Yeah, sure. So up to this point, we've been talking about uh, a lot of the technical information uh, behind fungal biopesticides, but there's also an aspect that the federal government handles with regard to regulation and review of biopesticides. And so that's handled by a group, a small group, about 65 people in the Environmental Protection Agency in the Office of Pesticide Programs, and then breaking that down into the Biopesticides and Pollution Prevention Division. Um, those folks work with uh, over overlying statute called the Federal Insecticide, uh, sorry, Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, and this basically uh, allows us to license pesticide products, and in doing so, we consider both the risks and the benefits of pesticides. 
the microbial pesticides have a specific set of data requirements that have to be met by potential applicants or folks coming into us to register pesticide products. And those can be found under our regulations, which is in the 40 CFR Code of Federal Regulations, part 158, subpart B. And in addition, if any of these pesticides are gonna be used on foods and that food is gonna be distributed in commerce, the residues of the pesticidal substance plus the other ingredients in the pesticide product, so it would be maybe the fungal active ingredient plus some other inert ingredients, those all have to have what are called either tolerances or tolerance exemptions set under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And so the EPA sets those, uh, again, either a tolerance or tolerance exemption, and then the Food and Drug Administration actually enforces those. So we don't just register these uh, without actually re reviewing data and looking at data. And again, as I mentioned previously, those are under our Code of Federal Regulations under Part 158. And some of the data that we look at are, you know, things with regard to human health, product characterization, and effects on non-target organisms like birds, wild mammals, fish, aquatic invertebrates. And all of those data have to be reviewed before we make a decision to actually license these products under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. We also have uh, the United States Department of Agriculture um, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Services, which examines microbes imported into the US and in interstate commerce, and they will uh, issue permits for those situations. APHIS focuses on plant pest characteristics of the Plant Protection Act and the Noxious Weed Act. And next slide. So what do we need to know for decision-making? Uh, as I mentioned previously, we do require certain data to be submitted to support a registration application. And so we don't want this to really focus so much on being a research effort where it's kind of like an endless loop of submitting information and data to the agency. We really want to get data that helps us make a decision on the risk of the product that's gonna be applied to the environment. So both on the environment and then also on human health. So I think now, We'll go back to John for a couple slides. Yeah, thanks. That was a picture of me in my younger days when I had glasses and carried a important binder full of the regulations that we use. Uh, what is important to know about the assessment for safety that uh, all these agencies do is that uh, the risk of an adverse effect is basically a function of the hazard that you can identify and also the exposure uh, to that hazard in the environment. And we focus a lot on examining the hazard components and in conventional uh, pesticide regulation that deals with a number of different toxicity assessments. Uh, and uh, in the case of the microbial pesticides, there's a lot known based on the biology of the organism. So a key component of the uh, assessment for hazard is the identification and characteristic characterization of that organism. Um, that has gone through a lot of changes lately from basically the nuanced identification that we all are familiar with. And you heard Mitch uh, pontificate at great length about the phenotypic characteristics of fungi that allow us to identify them in the wild. Uh, in, in the case uh, of in the, the microfungi that fungi we're that talking we're about talking here, about here. Uh, uh, there has been a movement toward using uh, genetic elements to actually do that characterization. So 
uh, within the period of time that I've been working with the agency, it's gone from microscopic uh, measurements and identification uh, to gene uh, genomic characterization and uh, phylogenetic analysis. There are also specific uh, tests that the agency requires for addressing the safety to humans and what are called non-target organisms. So that would be things like Janine just mentioned, uh, plants, uh, invertebrates, uh, arthropods, uh, fish, birds. And in the case of these uh, microbial pesticides, there's a special concern for looking at the ability of these organisms to express uh, pathogenicity or toxicity. So that's a little different than what's uh, examined for the conventional uh, uh, pesticides. And we're looking for basically the response of the uh, test animal to be able to recognize and pro provide an immune response to clear that organism from uh, the exposure that uh, uh, has been used in the test. But uh, for the final uh, assessment of risk, there's also a consideration of exposure and the probability of any of the adverse effects that show up of actually occurring with use of the pesticide as it's uh, described. Next slide. Uh, so like I mentioned, for uh, the human and animal health, uh, rodents are tested and they're examined for clearance of the organism. So this is uh, basically uh, an immune response. And what you're looking for is that the animals dosed at a, a high amount, much higher than would be expected for use of the pesticide in uh, commerce, and that the uh, test animal can recognize it and clear it, kind of like what we've been talking about with COVID, where you have a, an immune response that is specific to the organism. And besides being specific, it allows the uh, host that has been uh, infected to actually remove that organism and nullify its uh, adverse effects if there are any. So we also look at uh, toxicity. Uh, which could be like uh, skin or eye irritation that may be inadvertently happen with uh, application or mixing in, and uh, loading of these agents uh, in commercial use. And as Chris mentioned, for the fungal products in specific, there's the uh, issue of the possible mycotoxin production. So you've got the well-known mycotoxins that are involved in uh, uh, food poisoning type incidents with either um, livestock or uh, in some cases with human ingestion uh, that are associated with some uh, fungal species. And then there are also toxins that are elaborated that may not have as widespread exposure, but uh, need some kind of assessment for toxicity in uh, in that uh, particular organism as you're doing the safety assessment. The uh, cyclopeptides that Chris mentioned are something that's a little interesting and a little offbeat. Uh, unlike the uh, kind of uh, paradigm of production of proteins from RNA uh, to amino acids and then producing pepti uh, peptides and proteins, these cyclopeptides are produced by a single enzyme that mimics uh, protein synthesis and can produce and incorporate unusual amino acids and uh, other forms of peptides. And uh, it's just uh, like, like Chris mentioned, we're kind of uh, science geeks, the things that are unusual and off of the uh, normal paradigm type of uh, production uh, are intriguing to us. So in addition to the human and animal health, there are also specific tests 
to look at toxicity or infectivity in birds, fish, and in particular beneficial insects like uh, <clears throat> parasites and predators, um, and also, of course, honeybees. Uh, the strain has to be stable uh, when it's registered and deposited in a culture collection so that it can be retrieved and uh, used as a, if there are any uh, adverse effects noted uh, that can be retrieved and uh, more closely examined. And in the case of uh, food safety, if there's any possibility of toxins or metabolites of concern being produced, those have to be accounted for also. Um, next slide, and I think I'm turning over to Chris at this point. Yeah, thanks, John. Before we go to the next slide, I guess one of the things I wanted to point out is in terms of, uh, you know, terminology, people often talk about biological control or control or biocontrol or biopesticides. And these have different meanings to different people. So I'll, I'll use this slide has a, a green lacewing, a predatory insect, and then a ladybird beetle at the bottom there, also predatory insect which we consider as beneficial insects. Uh, APHIS would regulate these as biological control agents. Uh, we would not. So just pointing out that when you hear people talk about biopesticides, it has a legal ramification uh, under certain statutes. Now, I don't know why my screen is freezing again here, but... There we go. Okay, so let's give a few more examples. So on the left here, we have Amplomyces quisqualis, which is a fungal parasite that likes to parasitize other fungi. In this case, a powdery mildew uh, on a leaf surface. And what normally would be here, a little short conidia for with some asexual conidia coming off, this Amplomyces has taken over and it's of course usurp the metabolism to produce its own spores. And so I think that's, that's pretty clever. And it's something, again, probably wouldn't uh, ever notice it going on unless you uh, looked with a really decent microscope. In the middle, we have one of the bas few basidiomycetes we'll talk about tonight, Chondrosturium purpurium. And it, it is a pretty looking fungus, isn't it? And I don't know, I don't think it's edible, but uh, I'd be at least tempted to try some of those morels and cream sauce with this. <laughs> and um, I point this out, uh, th this is one of the few macroscopic fungi that we'll discuss tonight or that are in this uh, realm of entomopathogens and bioherbicides and biofungicides. It is used to knock down uh, shoot production from cut stumps. So the story I had heard behind this was that I believe it was in the Netherlands that uh, when people had imported some prunus species, uh, they kind of took over and when you cut them, they'd sprout even more the way that you know, like willows do. And so they came up with this fungus found it growing there and said, well, you know, if we put this on, we can reduce in, in this country and it's used in Canada as well. It's used a lot on, on poplar but it's in, uh, infective against all kinds of uh, woody species in the rose family, you know, like cherries and peaches, plums, et cetera, that you want to manage. On the right, we have a, uh, a quite different fungus. This is an Entomoptera muscae. This is one that's in this uh, sort of poorly characterized group of Entomopterales. Uh, what I think is cool about this, number one, the picture shows, you can see the uh, spores and mycelia pushing out between the uh, plates or the segments on this hoverfly. Now, this is a natural infection. Hoverflies are actually used for biological control of wasps, like in New Zealand, for example. But I, I want people to just understand that, you know, this infective response and, and sporulation, et cetera, goes on all the time around us. In that previous slide where Janine was talking about the regulations, you may have noticed that tarantula infected with cordyceps ignota. Now that's again, natural infection and uh, goes on all the time. You may well have seen this fungus somewhere in your life. If you've ever seen a fly uh, 
that died stuck to a window pane or a screen door. And then the next thing you know, a week later, there's a little white halo around it. These fungi, you know, forcibly discharge their conidia out in a more or less circular zone around the cadaver. And so they may stay there for several weeks. And um, the next slide, well, I don't know why it's not advancing now. The next slide is a related uh, uh, genus, Entomophaga rilli in this case which causes summit disease and various grasshoppers. The reason we're not talking about this group of whatever you care to call them, uh, Entomophthorales, Entomophomycotina, uh, they're in taxonomic limbo. There are some people that argue that many of the uh, genera and families in here are not actually even true fungi anymore. So in they're in a state of flux. However, I will point out that a couple of these uh, are really important ecologically. Matter of fact, many of them are important. Uh, gypsy moths, for example, uh, are often controlled naturally by explosions of uh, entomophaga, uh, and I apologize, I'm forgetting the species name right now. Uh, anyway, I'll think of it in a minute, but, but they actually took some of the uh, native entomophagas from the northeastern part of the U.S. grew them up. They are very difficult to culture compared to Metarhizum or Bulgaria. They're able to culture enough, transferred over them. I think it was Bulgaria, and just set them off, and they've just propagated over the years uh, into the population. And uh, it's a good example of what they call the enemy release hypothesis, where when the gypsy moth came over from Asia to the U.S. All its natural enemies were absent, and so it sort of just took off. But eventually, this fungus was able to be distributed both in the northeastern U.S. and in, over into Europe to help control uh, gypsy moth. The other thing I want to point out here, and I won't go into much detail because I see you're going to have a speaker, or we will have a speaker coming up talking about zombie fungi. So both in the case of the entomophaga, but especially with the ophiocorticeps on ants, uh, there are some research that shows that, that they take over the behavior of the insect. And you can see in both cases, these insects climb up high on the plant, get into a death grip on the plant, and die and sporulate. Uh, you can see the uh, cinemata coming out of the head of the ant on the right. The picture on the lower right is actually upside down. That's the undersurface of the leaf to help promote spore uh, dispersal into the wind or in the uh, blowing rain uh, as this thing sporulates. And curiously, some other insects uh, of the same species, whether it's the locust, the ant, will come along and try to mate with these cadavers. And that further helps to spread uh, the spores around. I don't know if anybody's seen this. I, I read about this. I've not seen it. There's a movie called The Last of Us about people who get infected with corticeps and you either fall into what's called a clicker and you end up sitting in a corner or you become a zombie that goes out and attacks people. But anyway, just bring it to your attention if you're interested. It's out there on a Scientific American blog. Okay, so now we get to my favorite fungus. Uh, singly Ecladium tetanopsis. Uh, some people argue it's now an Ophiocorticeps. I'll get into that in a minute. But it's an entomopathogen of the sugar beet root maggot, the insect that I worked on when I was with the Ag Research Service years ago. And this insect is the most damaging insect of sugar beets in the United States and Canada. It causes millions of dollars of damage every year as the larvae feed on the roots. So when I was doing some field testing of these nematodes we mentioned earlier that attack insects, um, they're up near the Canadian border and I happen to know the, notice the control plots that were sprayed with saline or buffer had some discolored root maggots, took them into the lab and what popped out is on the left side of the screen. These white horns are, are cinemata. Uh, the individual cinema is a compact uh, interwoven assemblage of hyphae. And along the surface are these various canidi canidiogenous cells. Uh, 
as you see in the right frame, these, uh, I don't know if you can see these sort of curved uh, cells right beneath the spores, they're referred to as phyllids. And they, and the manner of production of those spores helps identify the species. It looks almost kind of like a little Gatling gun of, of short cigars here. Uh, they're about uh, six to eight microns in length and two microns across, kind of about the size if you took about, you know, four E. coli cells and laid them end to end. So they're fairly small. The thing you can't see here is that uh, the fungus quite often produces copious slime. And that's where the name synglio comes from, it means with slime, uh, which is curious because it is more or less a soil borne fungus. And aerial dispersal is not always its best option. So it produces the slime that gets carried in water currents and by earthworms and thrips and springtails and other little uh, millipedes in the soil that drag it around. So thanks to Kathy Hodge and Rich Humber at Cornell, we happen to have a mutual uh, colleague uh, we knew from University of Illinois. And when I send him some pictures of my fungus and say, Joe, can you help me out here? I'm, I'm drawing a blank. He says, you have to talk to Kathy. She just found a fungus that looks just like yours. So we got in touch and turns out, uh, as you see on the right side here, she writes, mycologists are not necessarily good entomologists. And, and there's a whole long story that I'll just cut to the chase that basically she went to a place where they store these old insect specimens, some of them from back in the 30s, and was able to get a look at some of these and found out that the description by the original mycologist mistook the cadaver of the insect. He thought it was an elaterid, which is a click beetle or coleopteran. It turned out he was looking at the rear end of a fly and thinking it was the head capsule of a beetle. So long story short, that influenced his uh, judgment on what the species was and Kathy helped straighten that all out. So, you know, indebted to her for getting this because I probably would still be scratching my head. Is this a new species or is this something I just can't find in a book? So the question is then what's the next step? You got to characterize this pathogen. So culturing it, figured out through trial and error that oatmeal agar, and especially with old fashioned uh, oatmeal from Quaker Oats because I found out you lose B vitamins with the quick cook stuff. So that makes a difference in the morphology of, of the colonies, as you can see in one of the upper photos. Uh, needed some oil or fat source and threw in some cholesterol for good measure and found that this fungus would infect uh, the larval stages, of which there are three, and the adult stage of this root maggot. The canidia, uh, germinated relatively easy to collect in uh, you know just a saline or buffer solution and when you treat them uh, or treat the larvae with them within 12 to 24 hours sometimes longer depending on the uh, temperature and concentration of the spores you see penetration and then death within a week although in some cases in some strains it could take three weeks the cinemata interestingly off to me anyway, are phototrophic. You know, there are some fungi, including our beloved oyster mushroom that will not form properly in the absence of light. And these will bend the way young seedlings do in a pot on a windowsill, bend towards the light. Again, what's the advantage to that for a soil borne fungus? I have no idea, but I thought it was interesting. And then of course, you gotta start checking other species, both for utility, could this thing kill house flies or other flies? I checked some weevils, you know, a tobacco hornworm and a lacewing and that found no susceptibility, which is really a good thing. It shows that this fungus is very specific to its host. And then when I moved uh, back to the DC area in around 2000, uh, worked a little bit with uh, Muir Glen and Cascadian Farms, which are the organic concerns of uh, General Mills. And they were very interested in seeing if this could infect corn, seed corn maggot, because 
they are running out of controls and obviously being organic, they can't just grab a conventional insecticide. And I did find that the seed corn maggot was susceptible. The onion maggot uh, left, you know, sort of uh, equivocal in the sense that when you do these tests, if you have more than 20% mortality in your control group, the test is considered invalid. And so uh, still waiting to find out on any of the others. And as uh, Janine and John both mentioned, you know, what about all these other things? Mammals, birds, fish, you know, frogs, et cetera, even plants. When I first uh, started working with this fungus, there was a, a technician down the hall and she happened to have done her master's degree on bacteria that are endogenous or commensal to this insect and turns out critical for its development. So she was somewhat familiar with what I was doing and went in there and gave her my cultures. They, they would let me watch. I was not allowed to touch the electron microscope. Um, it was a, actually a state run facility, uh, North Dakota State University facility. And I'll never forget as I was walking back down the hall, she had asked me, she said, she was pregnant at the time. She was concerned. She says, is this thing infectious? Is it gonna infect me? And I just laughed. I said, of course not. And then when I got down the hall, I realized, I really don't know. You know, that's something I had mentioned, metarhizium occasionally, fusarium will infect people. So you can't just assume. I also want to point out that, you know, I don't want to give you the impression that all these insects are susceptible and they're just out there like pigeons waiting to be, you know, picked off. They have their own immune system, not as uh, complicated in some senses as ours, but it's still not as simplistic as you might think, for whether it's a root maggot or a beetle or whatever. They have a polyphenol oxidase cascade. So if you've ever cut a potato or an apple, banana, and you see it turn brown, that's analogous to the kind of thing that's going on here, except in this case, it's going on in uh, some cases at very high uh, rates of speed. Some cells actually carry around crystalline uh, prophenol oxidase, which is then activated in the presence of a fungal hyphae. There's definitely a chemical communication between the hyphae and the uh, insect. And in some cases, some of the fungi will actually change their cell wall chemistry to try and evade uh, detection. If you look at that uh, figure on the, the bottom right there, you can see the maggot on the, the upper part of the photo is basically dead and it's got several melanized or black spots. The fungi or, or the fungus uh, is ramifying throughout the tissues, the hemocele, blood sinus. The one on the bottom, it's got a couple of bad wounds, but uh, it's surviving. So somehow it managed to uh, mount a defense that was adequate. And there are other cells in there that are phagocytic, just like some of our white blood cells. There's a whole host of antimicrobial peptides, some of which are, are produced by the fat body in the insect and uh, active against fungi. The upper photo just shows again, I don't think we mentioned that major, vast majority of these fungi do not infect by oral consumption. Some do, but most of them have to be in contact with the cuticle or surface of the insect they have to have some minimal amount of moisture and they tend to uh, use a combination of enzymes and, and turgor pressure. You can see that spear-like uh, apressorium forming, pushing right through the cuticle and then infecting the uh, body of the insect. So again, as I mentioned, you know, this question, is it pathogenic to humans or livestock or plants? There aren't things you can just assume because you think you know something about the fungus, particularly with a new species. You have to ask yourself, uh, is it gonna persist in the environment? Well, where I was at testing, it was already there. So that worry was gone. But um, does it pose a risk to the people who are applying it? Uh, we know there's some variation just in the strains that I looked at from the Red River Valley area of Minnesota and North Dakota. And, um, when you have a new species, you can't go to the literature and look it up and see what its close relatives did or look like. 
So, uh, you know, that's one of the challenges. But I do want to point out that my, some of my professors used to say, oh, there are thousands more fungal species out there. And I was like, yeah, right. Yeah, I believe it now. Now, some of these what may not turn out to be Vi or I don't know what the proper term is, valid species in some people's eyes, and I'll get into that more in a minute, but they are novel forms of uh, many of these fungi. So that brings us to the taxonomy, which uh, you'll be relieved. I'm not going to go through all of this. I just want to point out two things. Uh, one is that there's the sexual stage or perfect stage called a teleomorph, and then there's an anamorph. I was working with an anamorph uh, called Sidglia cladium tetanopsis. But 2013-ish, 2014, the uh, group that does the botanical nomenclature as well as the International Mycological Association is moving towards this idea that although we have all these anamorphs, and in some cases we know what the sexual stage is because it'll actually produce it in a culture dish. But in many cases, like with my fungus, as far as I know, nobody's ever seen the sexual stage. So you say, well, it kind of looks like a cordyceps. So it belongs, you know, in the cordycipitaceae. Well, they've redone all of these uh, based on both morphological data and more recently with molecular data. So things are shifting around, to put it bluntly, I, in my opinion, things are a mess. And I think it'll continue to be messy because even though the move to basically abolish the names used for the anamorphs, and for example, if, if you try to Google singly cladium tetanopsis, you won't find much, but now people are starting to call it a file cordyceps tetanopsis. And that's because they don't wanna have two names for what they believe is the same fungus. I would argue if you don't have the molecular data and a significant amount of it that couples well with the uh, morphological and phenological development, then you don't have any proof. However, uh, it seems that's the way the taxonomy is going. And again, these things have moved around. The clavicipitaceae, some of you may have heard of Clavicheps purpurea, of course, the ergot uh, fungal infection on wheat and barley and rye causes St. Anthony's fire and you know, it's the source of LSD, et cetera. Um, you know, some of these things have gotten, gotten moved around. There are uh, some enzyme pathogens, certainly in that group. All of the cordycipitaceae are, are now considered as enzyme pathogens by definition. So they're using a utility type approach to say, well, they belong in this group. I would argue again that the molecular data and the morphological data tell you more because even amongst those entomophthora that I talked about, some of them are gut commensals and reptiles and amphibians and other ones attack plants. So if you wanna separate those into three groups, you know, the entomopathogens, the gut commensals and the plant pathogens, just based on where you found them, it seems even more artificial than it already is. So this is part where at some point here in the next couple of minutes, I would like to get uh, a little feedback from you folks. Uh, I patented that fungus and I'll never forget the attorney at ARS told me, he said, well, if they make shoe polish out of it, you own it. I did look briefly for antibiotic production there, couldn't find any, but uh, it raised a lot of questions with me is, so if I own the species, you know, what does that really mean? You know, I sort of, I control who can commercialize it, at least in the US, uh, who works with it. And it raises some, I think, some troubling ethical questions as far as, uh, and by the way, a patent lawyer friend of mine told me that the type of patent I got, you won't ever get something like that again. The laws have changed, but there are a number of them out there and active. To wrap up, I'd like to talk briefly about nematode trapping uh, fungi. There's a whole large group of them, mostly Eskimoiceps, but not totally. Uh, but there are other fungi that attack nematodes through toxins or direct pathogenicity. Uh, again, oyster mushrooms, several other species, and uh, Pleurotaceae, uh, Shaggy Mane, King Stropharia. And uh, there's this Myrothesium. This is an example of what 
John was mentioning that sometimes you have heat killed organisms that produces a toxin that kills some soil nematodes. And on the right, you can see these rings forming around a uh, thrashing nematode and, and they constrict a little bit, reminds me a little bit of a Venus flytrap phenomenon where they, they cut it off and use it as a food source. So I mentioned these various, uh, you know, adhesive networks, these uh, adhesive knobs on the right, adhesive columns and the next picture and then the constrictive rings. But I think one of the coolest ones is this Duddingtonia that is a commercial product. And I think Janine's gonna tell us something about it. Yeah, so the uh, EPA has actually registered a two products that contain Duddingtonia flagrants. Uh, they're called Livamol and Livamol with Bioworma. And so the thinking is, or how it's used, is it's put into animal feed and it's fed to various grazing animals like cattle, uh, sheep, and goats. And the chlamydia spores from the Duddingtonia flagrans actually pass through the gastrointestinal tract of the grazing animals and end up in their feces. And along with the the chlamydospores are also um, nematode eggs. So the gastrointestinal nematodes uh, come out in the egg form. They hatch as well as the, um, the germination of the Duddingtonia flagrans. And when both of those kind of get together, the Duddingtonia traps the nematodes that are emerging from their eggs. And it kind of breaks the cycle of, you know, you have the infection and then the excretion of eggs and then the reinfection. And this has actually been touted as, a, as an alternative to some of the conventional drugs that are used against uh, gastrointestinal nematodes because some of those have actually had some resistance issues, which John mentioned earlier uh, in the presentation. Okay, I see we're getting towards the end here. So uh, try and wrap up very quickly here. But I think most of what's here has already been said. I'll just point out that there are a couple of things that are unique about these biopesticides. In some cases, probably most cases, we use what's called an inundative release, where you flood the system with tons of spores to try and knock down an insect population. But in some cases, they can work as inoculative. And particularly in cases where you have migratory insects or over large areas, and governments are helping out with whether it's mosquito control or locust or whatever it is, these inoculative, uh, relatively uh, low volume releases can establish a pathogen or parasite in the environment that will help knock down. It's not gonna eliminate, but it'll help knock down the population. And I think with that, um, just mention that, you know, this is, if you're old enough, you remember, this is where we were, you know, 40, 50 years ago. I think DDT was actually banned in 72. But before that, I can remember as a kid, trucks playing, you know, high volume uh, foggers into the trees for Dutch elm disease, trying to kill beetles and the fungus with God knows what kinds of chemicals and spraying all us kids on the street at the same time. And my hope is that, you know, we get away from that mindset or that paradigm, use things like plant breeding and biological control mechanisms to try and uh, move forward. So with that, I just stop share here. So let sorry me- Sorry for going so long. By saying that was the most erudite presentation I think I've ever heard and it, it just leads me to know how much I don't know and makes me appreciate what the deep state really is. Uh, <laughs> people really know what's going on and have the wealth of knowledge that we all can appreciate and not so much share. So with that, uh, Elizabeth, do you have any questions that have come up on the board there that we can address? <laughs> 
there were some questions and a couple of votes against patenting and and you know we can leave the zoom meeting open when we're done with the sort of formal questioning if anyone wants to get into that topic in a, in a more like direct discussion format but um one of the questions that jeremy had was um was uh you know, what do you think about how many potential fund fungal pesticides there might be out there? Like how often are new ones being discovered? And I guess I would add to that, who's really doing the research? So you all are doing it as government employees. Is it mostly within sort of government research agencies or is it also being done in sort of academia and commercial settings? As far as the development and even just some of the basic research, you know, it's a combination of academics, the Ag Research Service, as well as uh, tons of little, medium, and even a few large companies. One of the things we've seen over the last five, six years, a lot of the big companies are getting into microbes. If you want to protect a plant, it's a lot simpler particularly in some cases they're genetically en engineered not in all cases it's easier to retool a microbe genetically than it is to breed a plant for eight nine ten years uh, particularly when you're working with like a biennial like sugar beet or something like that so there's a whole range of folks doing that kind of work and um, you take it for what it's worth but i read the other day from an industry source they expect the market to expand to 10 billion dollars by 2024 uh, you know, worldwide. And I think that misses out though, as I mentioned, in some cases for certain pests, you need the government to be behind it. So for example, John mentioned screw worms, mentioned migratory locusts. You can't get individual homeowners or even municipalities to go out and spray for that kind of stuff. And true with mosquitoes too, to a large degree. You need a government entity who's going to fund it and get the stuff out there over a broad range of geography at landscape levels if you really want to affect control of that pest, particularly if it's a vector. Uh, I, I would just like to say that I think that there are tons of things to still be discovered. Uh, the one that uh, I mentioned, the Grandivo, uh, the specific name is under hemlock. And that was discovered by Phyllis Martin, a very famous researcher at ARS Beltsville, uh, basically just doing, uh, looking for biological entities in various places. I've heard a lot of people in private companies who, when they go abroad or visit someplace, and this is against the law, of course, but they take soil samples from wherever they're staying in order to just go geologically or biologically prospecting for new agents. So there's a lot yet to be discovered. And I think it's up to people like us and uh, academics to you know, provide the samples, provide the input for, hey, I saw something interesting and report it to people. Um, for the... The fungi that you were talking about that were um, enhancing root health, the trichodermas, I think was one of them. Um, is that, what do, we, what do we think is sort of the biological origin of that? Are the fungi getting something out of that relationship? Is it a, it's not a mycorrhizal relationship or is it? And like, what, what's sort of the bigger picture of what's going on there about why the fungi might be enhancing the root health of these plants? Well, since John is our mycorrhizae expert, I'm going to let him handle that. Uh, yeah, I think I think that when I was doing mycorrhizal research, it was kind of viewed as just a maybe plant hormone and uh, phosphorus solubilization and uptake kind of phenomenon. Uh, I think, like Chris was mentioning, there are a lot more complex interactions between fungi and roots. And even the like minor colonization past the epidermal cells into the root cortex is enough to trigger some of these responses uh, from basically sensing non-pathogenic organisms to uh, enhance growth and trigger these um, 
defense systems. Uh, they're called systemic uh, acquired resistance or induced resistance that benefits growth. Uh, it's not clear whether it's through controlling low level pathogens or whether it's uh, truly uh, some kind of uh, beneficial uh, phytohormone kind of effect. You know, Ray St. Ledger has been working on this from the angle. He's actually mixing genes from trichoderma into metarhizium and vice versa. So maybe next time we call him back and we can pick his brain on it. Um, and Jonas was asking, are there any big unintended problems that you've seen with fungal pesticides? Like you talked about all the testing that has to happen that is trying to prevent it, but have there been cases where people missed something and there was a problem after it was released? I am not aware of any. We have a clause within that statute, Janine mentioned FIFRA called 682. And that requires anybody who's you know working with that product who uncovers an unusual or adverse effect they have to report to the agency in a timely fashion. We call we keep what is called a 6A2 database of those adverse effects. I'm not aware of any. John, are you? Or no. You? The ones that the most common thing would be like an allergic reaction to someone who wasn't wearing uh, protective gear or who had been exposed to it uh, continually over, you know. Uh, their career is an occupational exposure, but nothing um, has come to us through that mechanism. Yeah, the only thing I'll mention is just that, again, kind of like allergies, that you can never predict that there's not a single person on the planet that won't be allergic to something. Similarly, with people who are immunocompromised, and there are a lot of people, more than we probably realize, who have compromised immune systems for a variety of reasons. And I'll never forget when I first started with the agency, there was a report of a young child who passed away. I think it was in Australia. And they believed it had metarhizium growing in the inside the cranium. The parents wouldn't allow an autopsy, which I fully can understand. Uh, the child had been under chemotherapy for a couple of years for leukemia. So as a risk assessor, then it becomes challenging. You say, well, is this just a fluke phenomenon? And first of all, it's, it's the same species, but not the same strain you're working with, but it does you know, keep you up at night. It's like, if I approve this, you know, am I confident that nobody else is gonna come down with an infection because I said it was okay. And so it, it's taken very seriously. And who does all the testing? So for the things that you all are researching at ARS, then you're doing all of the testing, but say for one that's being developed by a commercial company, do you then sort of check behind them or is EPA doing their own tests or is it just data submitted by the commercial company that's developing the product? Well, what I could say is that uh, certainly some of the smaller operations will do their own laboratory studies in-house, but not everybody's equipped to do a cute oral tox pass study on a mouse. So I would say, and John can correct me if I'm wrong, I would say the vast majority of the data that comes in for review is third-party laboratory. Okay. So I don't know if you're familiar with Eurofins, it used to be called Wildlife International over by the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. They, matter of fact, uh, just hired one of their people uh, a couple months ago. That's all they do is testing. So, you know, she or her specialty was missed shrimps in Daphnia. And so we look to see, do these fungi or these bacteria, where we're working with, impact these? And, you know, it costs money. One of the things that we didn't mention, you know, it costs some money to do this. But when you compare what it costs, if you're going to do a new row crop insecticide or herbicide, you're talking 120 to 140 million dollars just for the regulatory costs for the studies. If you're doing a biological uh, fungus or bacterium, and you know you're not working with anthrax, hopefully, uh, you're probably going to cost you a few hundred thousand and far less time. 
because you don't have to do multi-generational studies like you do reproductive studies with an insecticide or a nematicide. And uh, Elizabeth, I just wanted to mention that there are a lot of people that are concerned about uh, the fact that the government doesn't do the testing and that they're relying on uh, private companies and testing labs to do this. The uh, labs are required to do it under uh, good laboratory practice procedures. There's a, a format for that and the EPA is able to inspect those labs to make sure that they have the facilities and the records uh, for the testing that they've done. So there is a check on the, the data that's developed and we look at. And someone asked, and you may have answered this in passing, but I wanna double check, are all biopesticides considered okay for use under the USDA organic rules or are some okay, but some are not? And do you know? Yeah, Janine. Yeah, so there are actually quite a number of biopesticides that are acceptable under uh, the National Organic Program, and um, they have to actually go through a special review with our division. There's a particular person in our division that actually looks at these, and he basically looks at the uses that are on the label. Um, which is going to be affixed to the product and then the composition of the product. And if it passes those two tests, then it can be used in uh, organic production. We also have uh, products that can be used for organic gardening as well. So like home, home and garden uses. But that does not include the, anything genetically engineered, which is another thing yeah. that we do look at on, as a biopesticide, but it's not cleared for organic use. Just a few more questions from the chat. Um, someone asked about the use of fungal pesticides for bees. Do you all know? Is that something that's... Well, I hope nobody's trying to control bees. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think to control, the, sorry, the, the, like the problems with colony collapse disorder and mites and that whole set of issues. There are no... Uh, fungi that are being looked at for those particular um, complex of diseases that are associated with colony collapse. Uh, there are other chemicals, uh, biochemicals that are being looked at. And just to kind of reassure people that all of the ones that we're looking at uh, are also tested against uh, honeybees to make sure they don't have any adverse effects on them. Mm -hmm. One thing that's interesting, I haven't worked with them, but I think Janine and John have, where some people are actually using both bumblebees and honeybees to move their fungal spores flower to flower. I don't know if you want to mention anything about yeah, that. Yeah, there's, there's a product that's registered. It's uh, Clonostachys rosea, and um, it's applied by bumble, uh, bumblebees and I believe honeybees. So there's like a little... Um, tray that's attached to the beehive and as the bees got to go out of the hive they pick up the pesticide on their legs and then they take it to directly to the flowers where it's needed so it's a more efficient way to apply pesticides uh, rather than spraying a whole field you actually get the pesticide directed to where it needs to go so it's mm -hmm. a really kind of neat product yeah this is for things like uh, gray mold detritus and monolinea where you know you you basically want to protect the flower and the fruit and it it instead of wasting it on the foliage and the environment it goes right to the fruit where it's uh, most effective interesting um there's a couple more here. Okay, I, I'm gonna admit, I, don't, I have no idea what this question means. Is there any research into lateral gene cluster transfer for understanding biopesticide activity? Uh, the only research, I'm sure there's more going on, but the only ones that I remember uh, was, again, Ray St. Leisure was doing some of that kind of work. We've had a few genetically engineered bacillus species, bacterial species, some of them produced actually in Columbia, Maryland. And they're on the market. Uh, they're for, you know, insect control. 
there are no, as far as I know anyway, no genetically engineered fungi that have been commercialized, although again, people are working on them. And that's one of the things, it's relatively easy with bacteria. There are certain functions called mob or mobility functions and certain replication factors that you can insist be removed from that particular strain. So that if it's out there, the chances of it laterally transferring its DNA to another microbe are drastically reduced. There's not such a thing with fungi as far as I know. So that's something if someone did come in with a uh, genetically engineered fungus for commercial use and it had anything that raised any eyebrows, then we would seriously have to consider gene flow, just like we do for the engineered plants. As a matter of fact, I'm giving a webinar on Thursday on gene flow and, and crop plants because that is, it changes the exposure scenario in your risk assessment. You have to account for that exposure. Um, and then so this may be something that you all don't know, but someone's asking about that they had heard that cordyceps spend part of their life cycle in plants. Are you familiar with? I have read that there are some cordyceps that do infect plants, but I'm wondering if that's still the case, only in the sense that from what I've read of some of the new rules, you know, if it's not an entomopathogen, it's not a cordyceps. And that to me points out the folly and, and to some degree the ridiculousness of some of the considerations for how we name species. I mean, I'm always convinced, number one, that the whole nomenclature, it's really for our benefit. It's artificial. You have to recognize it as artificial. You can use some of the molecular techniques to, to argue that over evolutionary time, these two things must have come from the same ancestor, and that's great. But don't forget that everything that's alive is evolving all the time. So, you know, as things uh, change and, you know, we're occasionally surprised, we find a fungus that's infecting plants, or I read about recently a, a, a mosquito that doesn't need blood to reproduce eggs, but it feeds on plant nectar. So there are always going to be those, those great surprises. But... Um, yeah, I don't know, Jane, you have anything to add or no? Well, thank you so much. I know we've run a little bit over, so thanks everyone that has stuck around. I would like to reiterate Tom's uh, statement about the wonderful abilities of the people who are members of the Mycological Association. And Chris, John, and Janine are perfect examples of that. So thank you for a wonderful tag team approach to uh, a presentation which we've never seen before with the with, the, with the, the skill with which you did it, uh, I will sign out and I would, uh, those of you who would like to can also. So good night for the Mycological Association and I guess Chris will stay on to talk about patents.